I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like. Hey, what's up, world? Welcome to this edition of I Mix What I Like right here at Black Power Media. Again, I'm Jared Ball, happy to be your host. Just wanted to do a relatively short discussion and maybe an introductory discussion, maybe the first of a series. I don't know. We'll see what you all say and what the response is and what I end up following up with. But um, that is uh, a, a quick look at what I'm thinking or I'm wondering or I'm asking about is Dr. Kianga Yamada Taylor's approach to internal colonialism theory, which has come up for me recently in uh, in the last 24 hours, that is, in a very interesting way, uh, which I will proceed to explain. Um, so initially it started with me getting a Google alert, uh, on my name saying that my name had come up in, in someone else's article. Uh, admittedly, this doesn't happen all the time. So when it does, I sometimes like to peek in and every once in a while, you know, usually it's, you know, something about buying power or something maybe related to, you know, my older work on, on hip hop or something like that. And it's, it, you know, they, it's rarely something where it's focused on my work or anything like that. So it's just, yeah, I just like to see, and it's just interesting. And this wasn't either, in fact, um, even less so, but, but still yet very interesting. Um, so I will share here what, what I ended up first seeing, which was this article by, I hope I'm pronouncing the name correctly, Adam Burgos, um in an article in uh, philosophy today um titled internal colonialism and democracy so when i saw that my name had showed up in association with this i said wow this is fascinating um i want you know i want in so to speak yeah um so I'm not going to get into uh, the the article goes in in a number of different and interesting directions. I just but but so I'm just going to stay specific to what. Um, so anyway, the reference to me that I discovered was was uh, uh, just making a point about black power being reimagined as black capitalism and then using um, uh, my buying power book as as a source for that. But below later in the page, I'm reading this i just and it's and um i'm not entirely sure what burgos does with all of this i haven't read the entire article i don't even necessarily under it's kind of outside of it, it it goes into philosophy and democracy so i'll maybe come back to that just on my own but but for for me and for us and this you know this is what sort of piqued my interest here um well, a little bit actually earlier, I mean, because the articles, it, it talks a little bit about the, the history of internal colonialism theory as it's been applied by black people here in the United States, which I'm going to come back to as a point in, in question about Taylor's work and, and which I'm by no means an expert on. So this is not me criticizing. It's just raising a question. I'm just curious. I'm just asking a question as I'm, you know, just sort of publicly sharing my own little experience here you know uh so so i you know let's not i don't want to get all of that you know let's not okay um and so uh, uh, robert allen is mentioned uh somebody i have uh, you know some experience with in terms of his work got to build with him a little bit come back to that a little bit uh charles pender hughes uh, as well, which I'll come back to in a moment also. But then I read this part here, uh, which, which, which I admit was really fascinating to me. The advantage of such a class-focused neocolonial understanding of African-American internal colonialism is visible in how it can respond to criticisms of internal colonialism framework. So in what, what Burgos does uh, that I think is interesting is, is again, reminds us of the early 2000s work of Robert Allen building on his previous work, um, Black Awakening and Capitalist America, most notably. I mix what I like.org and on this channel, I think we've we've posted some of the interviews with Allen and 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 you know any of that. So there's there we I encourage you to check that out as well. But in the early 2000s, he revisited the theory 
and tried to revise it in the Black Scholar Journal, which got kind of which which I was obviously fascinated by, given my own attempt to 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 revive the theory right around that same time. Because in 2005, in the in the article that is referenced here that Allen published in the Black Scholar. I was finishing up my dissertation, working with the same thing. So it was like perfect, you know, timing. Um, so what Burgos is doing is saying, Alan revived the theory in the early 2000s, bringing up, you know, internal colonialism theory that had been, been made popular in the 60s and 70s among black power revolutionaries. Um, and then Pender Hughes uh, uh, in his work ex looked to extend and expand upon in terms of what, what Penny Hughes has said about his own work, a, a 21st century internal colonialism theory um, in conjunction with, with his, his late mentor or Jegna rather, uh, Rod Bush, who I also got to meet briefly and, and discuss. Uh, and and I'll, I'll probably come back to that in a moment. But then Burgos, all that to say, Burgos then gets to, to, to Taylor who uh, whose whose work I had not read very closely in 2016, uh, admittedly. So so when I saw this, I was fascinated. Anyway, he says here, Kianga Yamada Taylor, for example, rejects the framework of internal colonialism, pointing out that the capital benefits of black exploitation went only to us went to only a small fraction of capitalists instead of society as a whole. For this reason, she suggests exploitation was not a motor of American capitalism in the way colonial resource theft was for other countries. So I read that and I said, I said, is that an accurate depiction of what she's saying? Is that right? Um, anyway, this article goes into, and maybe I'll come back to it another time, but the article goes into, uh, again, why Pinder Hughes's work is important in challenging this other reference scholar, Arneal, if I'm pronouncing that properly, and Taylor, and others who who look to to deny Black America as an internal colony, um, and uh, um, the article here goes through Pender Hughes's uh, 2011 work, was it, or 2019, 2010, and then a later work he does with Rod Bush in 2019, right? And the point that Pender Hughes is making ultimately as, as Burgos raises here is that internal colonialism, as it says here, is not an analogy or metaphorical, but is a very real re, uh, uh, experience and condition that black people face in this country. Um, and that black America must be understood as a colony being colonized alongside, as he says here, indigenous people here in the United States. Um, where, and I'll put the link in the, in the show description because where Pender Hughes, so, so a couple of years ago, Tierney Cherie invited me to debate Charles Pender Hughes on this subject. And this, is, this was really the only area I think we disagree um, which is which is is Black America one internal colony or dispersed via geographical location and, and arrangement of population into a, a variety of colonies? Um, so as he says here, my preference is to define colony as settler confiscated land plus the land on which the colonized reside. Then regardless of declared independence by the colonizer, unless the conditions of the colonizer equalized to that of the dominant population, those geographic concentrations of systematic subordination, the colonies of the colonized, are quite durable and will continue to exist even if they move and are reconcentrated. The colony colonies are reformed in another location. Uh, um, Burgo says, on the geospatial view, African Americans are a single colonized group, but one that exists across many different colonies. All right, so that little bit of a distinction that, that Pender Hughes makes is maybe the only area in which he and I disagree. I, I, there may have been a couple other little points that come up in our debate that I don't really remember that that completely. But but in general, we agree that internal colonialism theory, as it applies to black people, is not just a mere analogy or metaphor. It's a real condition. And that it 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 it, it not only is to be adopted as a, as a, a, a um, an, a, an analysis or a framework an analytical framework, 
but one again that is not to be seen as just merely a, a theoretical or metaphorical or a, as an analogy, but something very real. So in this sense, both Penny Hughes and I, though we might have our own slight disagreements here and there in terms of the specifics, agree in our disagreement with what is being presented here about Taylor's work. So I just thought that that was very interesting. And I didn't even know that she engaged this at all. So, um, I sought to correct my, at least a little bit to the extent, my lack of an understanding of what Taylor had been arguing and did look up the book in question from 2016, uh, from Black Lives Matter to Black Liberation. And again, this is not, I'm not getting too deep. I haven't read it very closely. I've only really begun to focus on this one section. I had read some of it back years ago. And, and you know, so this is, I'm, I'm just really raising a question that I think is fascinating. I am not looking to, you know, okay. Um, so in, in her discussion of from Black Lives Matter to Black Liberation, she does sort of stop off, if I could say it that way, to talk a little bit about the Black Power era and the Black Revolutionary era in the 60s and 70s, um, where she does bring up this, this, she recognizes that Black Powerites like Stokely Carmichael and Charles Hamilton in their, their book on the subject, Black Power, and others started to pick up this internal colonialism uh, uh, method of analysis for Black people. Uh, but, and as she says here, it was, however, inaccurate to describe Black Americans' relationship to the United States as colonial, despite these obvious similarities. The profits reaped from the exploitation of Black urban dwellers were not insignificant, but neither were they the important revenue streams back to the American metropole. The outflow of capital from the inner city worked almost exclusively to the benefit of the layer of business owners directly involved in economically exploitive relationships with the urban ghetto, such as bankers and real estate agents. This was not a motor of American capitalism compared to the cotton, rubber, sugar, and mineral extraction and trade that had fueled colonial empires for hundreds of years. Being an oppressed minority population does not necessarily mean being colonial subjects. Calling Black people a colonized people drew the Black struggle into the global rebellion against colonial oppressors. And then she goes from there to talk about Malcolm X and she sort of leaves the discussion, which I was a little bit confused by. So I will revisit this and 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 again depending on what some of the reaction is and what some of you have to say about this i i will um you know maybe do another part or discussion of this but so quickly i'm on the one hand i do not agree that um internal colonialism should be defined or the 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 definition of the internal colonialism uh, uh, relationship should be reduced to the amount of profit that is extracted and goes to what or whatever sector of the economy or whatever sector of business is, is exploiting and to what extent did that then, as she points out, um, become, how does she put it there? Uh, was not a motor of American capitalism. In other words, I don't think the point of the colonial relationship is is specifically or, or re limited to the ability of that exploitation to become a motor of American capitalism. For me, certainly, and I won't speak for anybody else, although I take a lot of this from the work of Alan and 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 uh, and, uh, and others in developing my own approach. But for me, and Jack O'Dell in particular, but for me, the issue isn't the particular form or the amount or the the, rel the, the relative uh, um, motoring of American capitalism. It's not just a financial, it's not just economic, it's not just, just material. It is also about an immaterial ordering of society. It is also about uh, 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 an extraction of image, an extraction of symbol, an imposition of symbol and image, a semiotic battle of sorts, so to speak, that provides those in power, which is why so much of my work on is focused on the media and propaganda element, even going back to, to I mix what I like. The, the point I was making there was that it wasn't that the extraction of Black cultural expression for reproduction and dissemination was just a business driving 
process. It wasn't, my focus wasn't on the, the internal colonization of black people driving economically American capitalism. It was, it was about understanding how media in that, in that case and, and hip hop as an ex cultural expression would be distorted and used to maintain black people as an internal colony. That is a source for uh, a, a geographically distinct population that would be a source for yes, economic ex uh, uh, exploitation, uh, but also would be a space, as Amit Cesaire talked about, for where uh, a, a place where the, the 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 ravages of society could be maintained and kept in check. And in other words, where white people could just go and either get drugs or sex or violence or some sort of other ex abusive, exploitative, re exploitative relationship and then come back home or they could bring uh, elements of the colonized back home with them to do elements of work for a time and then send them back to their colonized ghettos, et cetera, and so forth. So in other words, it wasn't just about the extent to which American capitalism was motorized or uh, um, fueled, uh, but but certainly that was a part of it, is a part of it, but that wasn't the extent of it. So I was a little, I am a little confused by her limitation of it, of the discussion of colonialism in, in her work here, apparently to this one issue. And then she doesn't come back to it much at all throughout the rest of the book. In fact, uh, almost not at all uh, that I've been able to tell. Um, and which, which leads me to one of the flaws I think I'm seeing uh, perhaps in, in that I would consider a flaw in Taylor's argument here in terms specifically around is uh, are black people in the United States a colony or internally colonized? is that she doesn't seem to address beyond a reference to Hamilton and Carmichael and maybe Robert Allen. She doesn't address the long history uh, and the, the various ways internal colonialism theory has been applied by black people here in the United States. So if you go back, for instance, and look at the debate, the debate hosted by Tierney Cherie between me and Charles Penderhughes, um, we both in our own various ways talk about all of this, the, the, the very old pre-communist, pre-Lenin, pre-Europe even, sort of, uh, view of uh, Black people here in, in what would become the United States as a nation within a nation. Um, the 1830s, I forgot the, the uh, Pender Hughes mentions this, the, the um, National Convention uh, among black people here where where nation within a nation was understood. I certainly pointed to to Martin Delaney in the 1850s making that point. So and then t my my favorite sort of was what Jack O'Dell was saying that it doesn't matter where you are physically, it's a relationship. So my whole point is it doesn't matter if it's black colonies or a colony internalized here in the United States. And really, as I said in that debate, wherever black people go, that that relationship follows because it hasn't been ended in a revolutionary way. So I'm more interested. Anyway, so I, I, I just thought that I would be interested to see what Taylor would do in reviewing and, and challenging or correcting even that history. Um, so I, if, if, if or perhaps amending and uh, adjusting her own perspective, I don't know. Um, okay, so but but we're not done there because there was more. Uh, it, it's fascinating. So I'm gonna put the I'm 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 continue to anyway. I'm just gonna leave it. Let me just leave it alone. So here at the um, African American uh, Historical Society Black Perspective site. They did a they did a roundtable discussion around Taylor's more recent work, Race for Profit, which I have not read. So I'm, you know, again, I'm limiting. I'm just looking specifically at at some of this commentary around internal colonialism theory. Um, and in this piece uh, by Jessica Ann Levy in in this roundtable response to Taylor's Race for Profit book. Uh, Levy says, think, titles it Thinking with Neocolonialism in Race for Profit. Um, and oddly, it seems like Levy is doing, is making some of the point that I would want to have made or would want to make, um, where she, I read it as a, as a 
a, a professional, pl pleasant, friendly challenge to Taylor to to revisit this idea. Um, but Levy seems to to be unaware of a lot of this work. I don't know. Maybe I'm being unfair, but it's not it's not maybe she's not aware. Maybe it just wasn't referenced here. I don't know. Um, so quoting Robert Allen, Taylor argues that initiatives represented a form of corporate imperialism, which served to undermine black radicalism in the ghettos far from places devoid of value. American cities were and continue to be sites of extraction. So. Anyway, let me back up here and, and just say Kiana, Kianga Yamada Taylor challenges popular notions about supposedly undesirable cities in her latest book, Race for Profit, how banks and the real estate industry undermine black home ownership, home ownership. Um, far from being a static site of dilapidation and ruin, says Taylor, the urban core became an attractive place for unparalleled opportunity, a new frontier of economic investment and extraction for the for the real estate and banking industries. And that's where she brings in this 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 quote of Robert Allen, but but apparently only to talk about corporate imperialism and not Allen's overall internal colonialism thesis, which is interesting. Go, continuing, Levy says Taylor is not the first to deploy the language of colonialism to assess the history of housing in the United States. And then Levy goes on to, to reference Kenneth Jackson, Peter Hudson and Paige Glotzer and others who have made similar assertions and i'm sure we could probably even find more if we look specifically for that but you know levy continues without challenging this fundamental equation at the heart of u.s re real estate industry taylor flips the lens to reveal the colonial process at work within black urban neighborhoods Again, continuing here, it is possible to extend the colonial analogy a bit further. And then Levy continues to do that. In other words, trying to make a point about how housing and redistricting and resetting communities and moving one, making it black, making it white, doing all this is, in fact, Dr. James Turner used to say this in our classes. He made the point that gentrification is a euphemism for for colonial removal I, f I believe that's a direct quote from something he said in our class but that was a point that he made all the time um so for me the question i would then you know again what levy seems to be doing here is saying to you know taylor you reference allen you reference the 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 uh neoliberal and the corporate imperial so as I'm phrasing it, what's up with eternal colonialism? Continuing, neo-colonialism, as Pan-Africanist and Ghana's first president, Kwame Nkrumah, explained, like colonialism is an attempt to export the social conflicts of capitalist countries, with the result being that foreign capital is used for the exploitation rather than the development of less developed parts of the world. In time, Nkrumah continues, investment under neo-colonialism increases rather than decreases the gap between rich and poor in the poor countries in the world. What Levy doesn't mention here, as, as, as I mentioned in my own work, is that Nkrumah also made the point very clearly that if you practice capitalism at home, that is itself domestic colonialism. So that was one of the many ways, or several, many, I think many ways I was proving or demonstrating, or at least making my own argument that black people here are an internally colonized community. Levy continues, and Kruma's description of neocolonialism holds certain resonance in the extractive housing programs described by Taylor and Race for Profit. In the book's chapter, Taylor joins others in adopting the term neoliberalism to describe the thrust towards privatization and the political, social, and economic rejection of social welfare state that followed Black struggles in the 1960s. Yet following Nkrumah, one might have used the term neocolonialism, yet following Nkrumah, one might have used the term neocolonialism to describe this shift and in so doing drawn attention to the global and long durée processes of american capitalism which have long extracted capitalism capital from white non-white bodies and properties again even as i was just showing in in taylor's book when she 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 first says black people are not an internally internal colony then she ends that section by talking about how um 
she says she says being an oppressed minority does not necessarily mean being colonial subjects. In the very next sentence, she says calling black people a colon calling black people a colonized people drew black struggle into the global rebellion against colonial oppressors, and then starts quoting Malcolm X to to support that point. That was one of the main reasons why I wanted to use ICT to put black people's struggle here in the United States back on the main stage of global struggle to connect it intentionally. So I will continue. I mean, I'll go, I'll look again, Taylor leaves that discussion there. So I'm, I'm, I'm not clear. It's anyway, obviously I have to keep reading, but it's, it's, it's not immediately clear to me why she would reject ICT and then make the point as Malcolm and others were making that it brings black people back beyond just an, an, as an analogy or metaphor, but, but literally it, it puts pe black people properly back on, onto, you know, uh, uh, in, into to the, the world stage as Dr. Clark, you know, would have said in one way or another. Um, anyway, so I just thought, I, anyway, so, so, I like what Levy raises here. I've always, I've been asking this, you know, even when it comes to racial capitalism, I don't know why we can't use colonialism or, or why is neoliberalism preferred to neocolonialism? I I think I know why. I think it's done because it, again, takes colonialism off the table and it takes colonial anti-colonial struggle off the table and puts, because a, a struggle against neoliberalism is more easily confined and framed and, 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 encouraged to be seen as something that can be addressed by mainstream politics, electoral, you know. Um, but once you start putting anti-colonial struggles onto the table, then it complicates things. And I think it heightens not only contradictions, but heightens the, the level of struggle. So I think it's interesting that Levy says Taylor might have just continued on with that and and, you know, Chances are, Levy continues, Taylor would not be opposed to such an application of the term neocolonialism. It actually bolsters her argument with regards to the various forms of extraction and accompanied, that accompanied the arrival of de jure independence in the formerly colonized world. That would be my point, but I think that Levy has not read Taylor's earlier work either, where Taylor already rejects this. She doesn't explain it. That is, Taylor, I don't think, explains the rejection, at least not well, but, you know, chances are Le Levy is wrong here, that Taylor is opposed, and I think I'm going to show you that she still is in a second. Anyway, continuing finishing here with Levy, one could go so far as to make the case that Taylor's predatory inclusion and neocolonialism are synonymous. Now, that was interesting to me as well, because humbly in my own work, I did make a, a direct comparison to predation and the predatory nature of, of, of imperialism and empire as forcibly creating colonies and subjects as opposed to democracies and citizens. So um, Levy and I agree here, but what I do like about these, these, these uh, kinds of websites and forums that, 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 um, Again, even I was a participant in, in 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 conversation with Robert Allen in the pages of the Black Scholar in the early 2000s, earlier part of the 2000s, the mid 2000s, whatever they were. Uh, what I like about that is that we get to see a little bit of this here. So, so Taylor does respond to Levy's point and others, but we're just going to focus on what she says to 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 Levy because, um, well, I mean that's just what we're doing here today. So Taylor does respond. All this was in 2021. I'm, all the links are in the show's description, so you can go review all this. Um, and says this. This exploitative and extractive relationship is grist for Jessica Ann Levy's sharp inv invocation of neocolonial subjugation as a framework with which to understand the particular form of coercion experienced by poor and working class black families. Working class black renters and buyers were central prey 
for the extractive designs imposed upon black urban and suburban space by the housing industry. Black communities were dominated, particularly by white municipal regimes, often in collusion with real estate operators, profiting from the substandard housing that dotted black urban communities. The neo-colonial focus on the productive work of segregation, not passive but active in the manipulation of black buyers and renters is crucial to understanding the persistence and longevity of our spatial arrangements. So here, at least in, in reference, Taylor has no problem with neo-colonial, at least use of the phrase. Um, but in other ways, the colonial framing does not work because the black housing problem was temporary. It was born out of the particularity of the post-war order that swung from overcrowded cities to urban abandonment. Within the span of a generation, you know what, maybe I should even make this a little bigger. I should help at least a little bit. Sorry about that. Let me let me come back here and continue on. Um, okay, but continuing. But in other ways, the colonial framing does not work because the black housing problem was temporary. It was born out of the particularity of the post-war order that swung from overcrowded cities to urban abandonment within the span span of a generation. As whites left behind perfectly habitable properties for suburban outposts, the spatial fix that exploited black renters and buyers as American cities reconfigured was temp temporary. Neither the outmigration of whites nor the urban rebellions of the 1960s represented an ongoing strategy for this particular kind of extraction. Black home ownership peaked at around 50% in the early aughts of this century, and it has largely stayed within the 40 to 45% range it was at when the Fair Housing Act was signed in 1968. The intensification of gentrification in the last two decades in major urban districts has led to the displacement of African Americans and the reignition of a reverse migration of black families back to the South. Colonialism is an economic as well as spatial relationship that may not exactly fit this case. So I'm, yeah, again, I, I'm not understanding the reduction that Taylor is making here akin to the one she seemed to be making in her previous work to these very specific The housing problem was temporary. I don't understand because in the very, doesn't she, wait a minute, because she's saying here that there was something that happened in the 60s and earlier. But then here we are, she's saying again that there's an intensification of gentrification just in the last two decades, creating a reverse migration. So again, back to what Dr. Turner used to say in our classes, isn't this just the neo-colonial or colonial removal of subjects? Isn't the fact that black communities do not have the ability, political, economic, or otherwise, to stay where they want and maintain themselves as they want, isn't that part of the colonial relationship? Or is Taylor only defining it based on permanently situated geographic spatial locations with that provide enormous or the, become the motor for American capitalism, because that to me is an over reduction that misses the point that, that even Carmichael and Hamilton and black power address in a variety of ways. They break down how colonialism, if I'm, I'm doing this from memory, but they talk about that. It's, it's political, it's cultural, it's, 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 or it's economic, it's social. It has various elements to it. It's not just, uh, and then for me, again, the, the colonial relationship creates this immaterial, psychic violence, semiotic violence that, that maintains. And then to me, it doesn't matter if, if the black colony or colonies, as Pender Hughes says, are in pockets here or there, it is that they, similar to what I, as I understand the Palestinian situation, uh, 
if you can divide a population and house it and move it over here, and then if necessary, bulldoze it and move it over here, it doesn't matter that the original land that those people were on is now not theirs or they've been moved off of it. It doesn't change their relationship to that colonial power. And then ultimately it doesn't change what I think or what others might argue should be done in response to that colonial situation. So I'm not... Moreover, uh, Taylor continues, it doesn't fully represent the different political re responses to segregation included, including a failed effort of George Romney and the home building industry to push low income black people into the suburbs for the political and economic for political and economic reasons. Romney's experience as governor of Michigan when, when Detroit rebelled in 1967 convinced him that the U.S. was on the verge of unraveling if ghettos were not deconcentrated. Debates over where African-Americans should live not only raged in white suburbs, but among black activists as well, reflecting legitimate concerns that the fusion of African-Americans throughout white suburbs would dilute emergent black political power. Of course, Romney faced steadfast opposition from Nixon, who opposed the term and what he termed forced integration. Suburban enclaves deployed increasingly esoteric inventions of zoning laws to keep poor and working class black families out of their communities. And the same thing happened, by the way, to 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 more affluent black families and communities. They weren't allowed to move in and wherever they wanted. And again, I used to make fun of that early 2000s infamous moment where Jay-Z couldn't even buy his way into one of those elite Manhattan whatever, because not because he couldn't afford it, but because he didn't have the social clout. He didn't have the the immaterial power. Some historians don't, Taylor continues, don't like the term neoliberalism as a framework. As with many frameworks, they can be misused and misunderstood. But neoliberalism remains, remains a powerful tool in my work. The New Deal state and the great society fell far short in their provisions for black families compared to how they subsidized white families, thereby dismantling systematic poverty and creating white middle class. They did not have nearly the same impact for black families, but their impact was meaningful enough that it led to historic shift in black voting patterns. Also, black poverty plummeted from 1959 to 1974 from 55% to 30%. To be sure, it was still too high, but government intervention had made a difference, but so did a lack of intervention. Again, I'm not seeing how any of this challenges the internal colonialism thesis. Throughout the Ronald Reagan presidency in the 1980s, black poverty was on average about 30%. Ronald Reagan honed his own war against welfare in the post-1968 era in California, arguing that government intervention in black communities created the problem of black dependency. But neoliberalism's, anal neoliberalism's analytic is not about its uniqueness or innovative qualities. It is about the deployment of these political and financial tools in the context of a crisis in the 1970s and the perversion of the social contract in the name of the restoration of profit for the capitalist class. As Kimberly Johnson argues in her review, under the spreading aegis of neoliberalism, the primacy of profits would become defined as the essence of public welfare. In housing, this meant the wholesale abandonment of a federal role in the provision of housing or housing assistance for poor working class people while market bound schemes reign supreme throughout the real estate industry, replicating racially discriminatory mechanisms. And then it ends there. So I, I don't I don't. So in that piece and what little I've read in this in this other book, I'm not seeing where Taylor. I think properly addresses internal colonialism thesis, how it was deployed, how it is still being deployed, or why neoliberalism is a better approach. I don't get it. Other than I, I would only be able to speculate and say that neoliberalism, uh, again, makes the argument more palatable for mainstream audiences. It makes, uh, it, it reduces the likelihood of radical reaction, I think, as opposed to an anti-colonial process or theory or um but ultimately i just don't i'm not i'm not seeing how she's creating how how she's working with these terms or defining them so i just thought it was interesting um and i was shocked to initially to read in that initial article that started this process for me 
that she seemed to only be defining colonialism based on the amount of financial extraction she, that, the, that the colony provides. So I, again, are you know I don't I don't I don't I don't remember the details, but but is is um, was was um, was Tanzania less of a British colony? I don't know, you know, was Kenya less of a British colony than Ghana because it didn't produce as much money for the British Empire as Ghana? So are then the Kenyans not as, are, are they neoliberalized and the Ghanaians colonized? I'm not, so like that, I would like to see that Taylor, I would like to see her, um, and if, and so my point, so this is what I was gonna, this is my, one of the asks for our audience. If you're aware of her work on this, moving beyond what little I've seen, please let me know. Um, and obviously if, if if anyone feels I've misrepresented anyone's arguments, obviously let me know that as well. But otherwise I just wanted to quickly, you know, look at this and then conclude by saying yet again, I think um, internal colonialism theory remains, uh, if not the best, uh, as valuable as any other in assessing the condition of black people here it puts black people back onto the world stage and reminds everyone that what has been happening to black people here is a variation of what has been happening to African people throughout the diaspora. Um, so for instance, you know, like I know Taylor will, you know, for instance, in that 2016 book, even she will, she will acknowledge the settler colonial origins. So maybe I need to learn more about how, you know, how where Horn and others deal with this too. Cause if, if it's a settler colonial origin, then why isn't internal colonialism part of a response analytically or otherwise? Where does that break? How do we go from settler colonialism being the foundation, but neoliberalism being a better analytical frame? When for me, neoliberalism was just a concoction of Milton Friedman and that generation of economists who were trying to find a new way to get people to become colonies without using the language that is privatize all of your natural national nat, privatize all of your nat, national and natural resources specifically privatize them so American businesses can take them over and extract as much as possible uh, and destroy all of your socialism, destroy all of your redistribution and let um, American business run your economy and ultimately your nation. That to me is colonialism. I don't, so some of these differences between me and Pinder Hughes, between Pinder Hughes and Rod Bush who, by the way, agreed with me, rest, may he rest in power as well. And even Pender Hughes had to acknowledge that in our domain. No, I'm just playing. But but I'm just saying, um, all of those discussions and debate, I think, are, are wildly interesting and great parts of the history. So I would love it if, if Taylor and others would go back and revisit the ongoing work, obviously, but those histories of, of, of Africans in this country, of Black people in this country using that approach um and 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 seeing what's what with it um as opposed to just dismissing it as it looks like she did in 2016 at least by saying oh that dumb, that that radical stuff you did it. she didn't say it this way but it reads almost like that radical stuff it was cute but it really doesn't get to the issue and i'm like i don't know i don't see how it doesn't get to the issue so anyway that's it. All the links will be in the bio, uh, in the show description, that is. And uh, thanks for checking this out. And uh, I think that's it. So, yeah. Catch you next time here at I Mix What I Like and throughout the BPM channel. Thanks again, everybody. Peace only if, as Fred Hampton used to say, you're willing to fight for it. Catch you next time. I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like.